Um, it's really a great pleasure to welcome Zhou Xiaolong Thank you. to Thank you. Sydney for the first time. Um, you've been to Australia before, but to Brisbane, so we're very glad that we've got you further south to Sydney. Um, we were talking earlier, and um, Xiaolong said that Sydney reminds him in some ways of Shanghai, um, which it, it does me too, or particularly the area um, around King's Cross, um, where, <laughs> where I live. Um, well, I'll have to be there. Yeah, you'll have to get there. Um, and uh, it's, it's good to be welcoming you here um, with the recent success of your latest book, um, Years of Red Dust. This is just out in English. Um, it's already appeared in French and German, yeah. I believe. Um, I think it's not actually published in Australia, um, but you can get it at Abbey's, I'm told, um, otherwise um, online, mm -hmm. I would think. Um, it's subtitled Stories of Shanghai, and it's a set of short fiction set in a laneway in Shanghai um, from 1949 through to the recent present. So there's a strong historical perspective in this book. Um, and that's really the first question I want to um, ask you. Uh, as, as you've heard, um, we met in Shanghai. Um, as I remember, it was 1987. Um, I was teaching at East China Normal University in the Australian Studies Centre there. And Cho Xiaolong was working at the Shanghai Academy of Social Sciences. That's right. Um, and I think your translation of T.S. Eliot um, was in the pipeline when we met. It yeah. was not quite published. Mm -hmm. um, this was, um, as far as I know, the first translation into Chinese of four quartets mm -hmm. uh, in particular. Um, I was at ECNU um, and my visit was partly funded by the literature board. Um, so I was also a kind of writer in residence. Um, it was a, I was a guinea pig um, for an attempt to see whether there could be um, a writer in residence program in, in China. Um, so as well as teaching, I was, um, I was writing my own work. Um, it, it went very well and it was taken up as a model. Rodney Hall came the year after, I think, and since then there have been many um, residencies. The management of them was taken up by Asia Link, um, and there's been a whole sequence of them. And more recently, the Shanghai Writers Association mm -hmm. has initiated its own program of residencies for foreign writers. Um, and my colleague at UWS, um, Gail Jones, had that residency in Shanghai um, a couple of years ago. Um, so in that context, um, I was introduced to the Shanghai Writers Association back in 1987. There was a round table at which I was invited to speak about Australian literature, and that's, that's how we met um, yeah, through the Writers was Association. Yeah, I was you were a member of the association. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm back in 1987. So the question is, and it's a big one, but it's a, a good one. Uh -huh. How has Ch Shanghai changed from 1987 to now, in your opinion? Um, we're familiar with the ch completely changed skyline. Um, those tall, bu the, the very tall buildings were just not there in 1987. Um, some of the others were, in uh -huh. fact, yeah. Yeah, I don't think any of the building across the river was there at that time, right? Right. Yeah, maybe Pudong. some of the Pushi ones yeah. you could have seen, but yeah. not, that definitely one, not. That yeah. 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 But that's, that's really a big question, you know, how things have changed. You just mentioned we met in 1987 at Shanghai Writers Association. I think one of the reasons I was, I was there because I was one of the few spoke English at that time. But nowadays, if you want to travel to Shanghai, you don't have to worry about that. A lot of young people 
can speak English. And, uh, but of course, it's much more than that, not just the, all the high buildings, mm -hmm. not all the, like the new, new roads, uh, new shopping malls, all the ultra-modern decorations. It's, it's much more than that, and it's the people also changed. Uh, I remember when I first went back from the United States in 1995 or 1996. At that time, a lot of Shanghai people asked me how things were in the United States. But nowadays, when I go back to Shanghai, people kind of teach me. Do you know that? You know, <laughs> this is the brand we wear. So I feel more or less like country bumpkin, you know, back, back <laughs> home. In, in, in. Especially for me, back from St. Louis, it's not like Sydney, like it's a well-known <laughs> city, right? Uh, and all, you know, the, the materialistic, you know, view of life. And, uh, and it's, it's, it's a very complicated picture. Like when I was there in my first book, I, I wrote about the crowded living condition, the Shikuman house. 20 or 30 families share one particular two-story building in Shanghai. And it was true at that time. And nowadays, of course, you have so many new buildings in Shanghai, but you have different problems, right? You know, the housing price so high, that's another, you know, situation. And uh, so in a sense, I can say that because Shanghai has changed so much, China has changed so much, my books have been an effort trying you know, to come to terms with the change. Like my main character, this chief inspector Chen Chao, he does not always have an answer to that. <laughs> he just tries to find the answer you know, in the process. Mm -hmm. in the process. Mm -hmm. um, when I look at Shanghai over this period, um, the change in the physical environment is, is so striking. Um, as you say, Pudong, mm -hmm. the other side of the river, was really not there mm -hmm. in 1987. Um, and in the process of change, a lot of buildings in the center of the city have been knocked down. Mm -hmm. New ones have gone up even higher. Um, sometimes people have moved from the center to the outer suburbs. Um, and what I've always wondered is whether there's an experience of future shock living through so much change so quickly. I wonder how the people who live through it experience it. Uh, maybe it doesn't seem to them like so much change because it happens day by day and mm -hmm, they, mm -hmm. they simply live it. Um, or is it something that is difficult to, to manage? I think to a, to a large extent, because living there day by day, you may not feel that much about it. And in that sense, I think, you know, maybe I'm even in an advantage when I try to write about Shanghai. Because yearly after half a year, one year, I come to visit Shanghai again, I'm shocked. Right, so I got something new to write about, and then you know, in another half year. So sometimes I talk to my Shanghai people. They seem to take it for granted. Yes, that's the way it should be, right? But why you are touching shock? Why you know you feel so you know puzzled you know about it? For them, it's just like you know, they, they, some like my sister. I talked to her about that. They, she does not even feel about that. Mm -hmm. It just happened. Yeah. Do you think that's something special about the Shanghai knees? Um, that they've always been um, participants in extraordinary changes, uh, one way or another, ever since the city began. I think you can say that. Yeah. You can say that, and also they are really good adapting, you know, to the change. 
not just right now, even in the history of the city, right? They always do that. And uh, I think when I was when I was student in Beijing in the in the late seventies. Uh, one of the most favorite, you know, comment I would like to hear from my friends in Beijing, actually was, "You are not Shanghainese, or you are not like Shanghainese," <laughs> <laughs> because that means you are more like you know northern people, right? You know, more like open-minded, not that you know adapting you know to the change or to the the kind of special value of the <laughs> Shanghai culture. So I don't know whether they will still say the same thing to me. <laughs> you have to be careful. I don't know who in the audience is Shanghainese and who no, is No, no, I'm a Shanghainese. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure there's a mix. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, all right, well, the other side of that question is, are there things that have not changed since 1987? Um, important things? Uh, definitely, definitely. Uh, like, you know, this, this collection of short stories are really based on a real lane. And fortunately, this lane is still there. This lane is still there. And last year, I went there with a German German producer with the you know, production team, and uh, they, sh they shoot a lot of pictures and things there. And I talked to the people, you know, suddenly it seemed everything coming back at that moment, and uh, some basic, you know, things still there. Still there yeah. mm. What kind of things? Uh, for instance, you know, the, the thing we have just mentioned, so the way they deal with the change, you know, the, the struggle, and also the practical manner, like they adapt, right? Mm. And uh, they can always find something in, the, in their choice, you know, in the way of their living. And, uh, and you can also say that, at least for some people, the living condition still remain the same yeah. there. Yeah. Yeah. And ironically, you know, the, the same living condition has been kind of put in a grammar light now, right? You know, this kind of Shikuman house, uh, when I was there in the 70s and uh, 80s, it was seen basically as the poor, backward uh, house or living condition. But nowadays, Shikuman is kind of special Shanghai architecture yeah. style. And, uh, but now that it seems to be so fashionable, mm -hmm. right? So valuable. And the people kind of lost in the collective nostalgia about you know, this kind of style popular in the 30s and in, in the 50s. Mm -hmm. So that's something I get lost you know, from time to time. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's yeah, changing so that, much, back and forth, not just like one direction. Yeah, yeah. You know, this kind of old house used to be, it's, it's not that positive, right? Now it's so popular and uh, so, so expensive too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, from my perspective, um, one of the things that has changed from the 1980s to now, of course, is Australia's relationship with China. Um, in the 1980s, it was relatively unusual to see a news story about China on the television news. Mm -hmm. um, it was relatively unusual to go along the street in Sydney and hear people talking in Mandarin. Mm -hmm. Now you hear Mandarin every day. And when I watch the television news, there's a China story virtually every day, um, usually in the finance section, um, but, but certainly somewhere. Um, there's there's a sense that um, Australia and China are linked um, in so many important ways in this contemporary moment. Um, but 
what I wonder is whether to understand this contemporary moment in China, um, we also need to understand the past. How much it is important to understand the past. Um, in your novels, your, your detective novels with Inspector Chen, and Shanghai is your subject, but I find you're often writing about the past. Um, you're writing about the early 1990s, mm -hmm, which mm -hmm. is a period mm -hmm. um, familiar to you, but often there are stories that go back even further. I um, mean, the most recent one is called The Mao Case, yes. and goes back into Maoist China. Mm -hmm. um, the current leadership in China all have a complicated history um, which goes back into the Maoist period and mm -hmm. even further back. So how important do you think it is for people like us here in Australia who want to understand contemporary China to know this and understand this back story? Oh, okay. Well, maybe let me give two answers to your question. First, a short one about uh, you know, the contemporary Shanghai and Australia, you know, uh, relationship. Uh, not too long ago, I was back in Shanghai and I talked to a British publisher about things in Shanghai and the one question, he had been living in Shanghai much longer than I now. <laughs> and uh, one question uh, uh, it was about which is the most popular restaurant in Shanghai. <laughs> you know the answer, right? <laughs> it's, it's, it's one on a bond called M on a bond, run by an Australian woman. I don't think I need to measure her <laughs> name. <laughs> you know about that. And, uh, it's, it, and I, I asked him why. She said, maybe just because she loves <laughs> Australia. <laughs> it's so popular. And, uh, and also she has been running, you know, the Shanghai Literature Festival, right? So, okay. Now, to your question about uh, why in my books, why always the past and uh, not just the present. Uh, for me, you know, to understand China, uh, it is very important not only to look at the thing happening right now, because you can hardly understand them in isolation. You have to, a lot of things in China can be understood only by putting them in a larger background, a longer historic background. Why people behave like this today you have to understand what happened during the Cultural Revolution, right? And uh, that will influence why, for instance, like we just mentioned about the housing price, you know, people grabbing for the apartment. But if you knew something about in the 50s and 60s, how people crowded in this kind of Shukuman house, at least you will partially understand why you know, people are willing to pay such a high price for t today, right? And uh, so a lot of things for me you know, to understand China, you have not only examined the things happening right now, you have to look further back into the past. Only then you can have a comprehensive picture. And uh, that's what this Chief Inspector Chen has been doing all the time, all the time. Mm. Thank you. Um, let's, let's talk about you as a writer a little bit, if we, if we can. Um, it's, uh, your, your writing career is um, fascinating and very unusual one. Um, you begin as a translator mm -hmm. of T.S. Eliot. Um, you go in 1988 to the United States um, to for postgraduate study. Mm -hmm. um, to, you go to T.S. Eliot's hometown, yes. in fact. Yes. Um, 
and you tell a nice story at one point of walking along the streets in that town on arrival asking people where is T.S. Eliot's house where is T.S. Eliot's house and they say who? <laughs> 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 um, and then I think you were already as I recall you were already writing poetry in English in Shanghai. Yes, um, yes. And very good poetry in English. So it's not surprising that on reaching America you would continue to write in English. But what you write or first publish mm -hmm. is the first um, Inspector Chen detective story. Um, and there are now six of those and they're extraordinarily successful all over the world, um, you're writing in English. Mm -hmm. At the same time, you're writing your own poetry, also in English, and I have a copy here um, inscribed uh -huh. from some years ago um, of your poetry book, Lines Around China. And at the same time, you are also publishing translations of classic Chinese poetry Tang Song poetry. So you, as a writer, you're wearing quite different hats, um, you might say. And uh, this book is fascinating because it's it's divided into sections. The first section is called Lines Out of China. The second one is called Lines in China, and the third is is called Cafe Revisited. Cafe, a kind of imaginary, um, ancient, cultural space of China. Um, so in your writing work, there's a kind of a doubleness um, that I see uh -huh. uh, between two cultures, two languages, um, between detective fiction and classic literary translation. Um, you are one of very, very, very few people um, from a Chinese language background who has established a major career through writing in English. Um, I can think of Lin Yu Tang, um, Ha Jin. Um, there are not many in that category. So can you tell us about that, how that happened, um, why? how it feels? I don't know how that happened. <laughs> uh, in, in, in one of my inspection books, I have him quote a Chinese proverb, Ying Cuo Yang Cha, and I translate that into the, the causality of misplaced Ying and a Yang. <laughs> uh, it, it just happened, you know, uh, Yes, I, when we met in Shanghai, uh, I was doing translation, uh, T.S. Eliot, W.B. Yeats, you know, some other English poets into Chinese. I was also writing some Chinese poems, and that's, the reason I got admitted into the association. And uh, I was also try, uh, writing some English poem. Mm -hmm. I did not show that you know, to too many people, but you are one of them. Uh, because I did not think you know, these English poems will be published. It's just something I wrote you know, for fun, just for fun. Uh, then I went to the United States as a Ford Foundation Fellow. Uh, again, you know, the Yin Chuo Yang Cha, you know, this kind of misplaced in the Yang. I, I started writing in English in series. And I did publish some poems and uh, in English, of course. But then, in 1995 or 1996, after six or seven years in the United States, I went back to China for the first time. 
I was really impressed, you know, by what's happening there, you know, all the change. So I thought, well, I should write something about it, about this society in transition. So I should I'll do that. So first, I wrote a long poem. I call that Tan Quixote in China. And it's published, and it's, you know, some critics like it, but I was not very happy. Because maybe, you know, the poetry deal with personal emotion, feelings as a, as a vehicle that's very convenient. But when I wanted to write about society in large, it's not, you know, that adequate. So I thought, well, maybe I should write a novel for that purpose. So that's how I started, you know, working on a novel. But maybe because before that, I have never done any fiction before. So I really had a hard time putting my material together. And in that way, mystery, you know, the crime novel really came to my rescue. Because with this particular genre, usually you have a body at the beginning, right? And then you need to find who did it, and you have a conclusion. So it's something like a framework, a ready-made structure. And into the structure, I can put in whatever I want to say. And, but then, once I started experimenting in that way, I find it's really convenient for my purpose. Mm. Because originally, I want to raise some questions. And who could be a better persona to raise questions than a cop, right? He can knock at people's door and raise a question and justify looking into people's lives. Mm. I said, OK, maybe let's try a little bit longer. Mm. <coughs> but maybe from the very beginning, it's sociological. So I, I did not know when I finished the manuscript, the first book, whether it is mystery or not. I, I give the, you know, the, the manuscript to my American publisher. And she read it. She said, well, it's mystery. And we want to sign a contract with you for three books. And of course, I was flattered. Wow, three books. <laughs> but once I signed it, I, I thought, well, I got into trouble. I have to write the <laughs> second one. <laughs> I write the third one. So right now, I have written six books in that particular Inspector Chen theory already. Actually, seven. The seventh has come out in French already, but not in English yet. So last year, well, not last year. Well, it's last year when I you know, gave the, the English manuscript of this collection to my publisher. Actually, my American publisher were not too happy about that. They said, well, your inspection can sell. Short story, you know, it's difficult. <laughs> So, but I said, well, you have to take it along with the inspection. <laughs> and uh, as a matter of fact, uh, this one also came as a result of inspection, ironically, because it's so difficult to publish poems nowadays. And uh, uh, a local publisher actually came to me. He said, I know you're writing poetry. I know you were not giving your novel to me, but because of the inspection, I believe your poetry book can still sell. So I won't do that. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a lot of things can be so ironic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so ironic. It's, it's not really you have planned it this way. Uh, finally, about you know, the translation I'm still doing, you know, about like the classical Chinese poetry into into English, to some extent, you can also say it's a byproduct of the inspection novel. Of course, I always love poetry. I always love uh, translation and always love classical Chinese poetry. But because I was aware how difficult to publish them, so I really tried to smuggle in as much as possible in my inspection book. Like my own poems, and the Tang and the Shun Dynasty poems. And uh, sometimes it's not even in the, in the persona of Inspector Chen. Like in one of my books, I have the murderer to write a poem. It's kind of creepy <laughs> experience. 
But then, because some readers you know, read the, the poetry translation, they like it, they wrote to me, and they wrote to the publisher. So actually, it came out that way. That way. So I'm quite happy about that. Well, <laughs> I, I think we're all um, very happy. I mean, it seems a brilliant um, choice or, or strategy to, to write the detective fiction, and, and you do it so well. Um, if you go into a bookshop, um, you will find these books in the crime section, yeah. um, not usually in the literature or the fiction section. This seems rather unfair because, in fact, these are extremely literary novels, um, not just because people are always quoting poetry in them, uh -huh. um, but th they're very substantial novels. Um, they tell an enormous amount about life in, in Shanghai. Um, as you said, it, it was kind of sociological mm -hmm. to begin with. Um, and I, I think that is definitely there in them. Yeah, for me, and uh, for me, it seems sometimes it seems not enough to just write a murder case. Mm. So, usually, with one particular book, I try to introduce something above or beyond that murder case. And sometimes even the idea came to me not because of murder case. For, for example, when I wrote the book, When Red is Black, I think that's number three in the particular series. Actually, the first thought came to me when I stood by my father's grave in Shuzhou. He was, uh, he owned some small business before 1949. And because of that, he was black, right? You know, black in Chinese language can mean politically untrustworthy, bad, almost class enemy. And the red, of course, means a popular positive. But when I visit his grave in Suzhou, so many things have changed in China. And as Deng Xiaoping said, to be rich is glorious, right? So nowadays, it's politically OK, and it's almost politically red, right, to own your own business, to make money, to be rich. So I, I could not help thinking, well, you know, he suffered all this, my mm. father, for nothing. If he lived by now, he's red, right? He's not black anymore. Mm. But then it's not just him alone. A lot of people like him. And also a lot of people who used to be red, but nowadays if they were poor, and they could be nothing, right? So there had an idea, you know, in I want to write a book in this kind of ideological or social value turned upside down, crime, tragedy can take place. Once I got this idea, I really like, you know, the framework is already there, right? So I really can put things into that mm. easily. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, we were talking earlier about how things have changed in, in Shanghai over this period. Um, what about literature itself, uh, publishing, writing? How has the, the literary scene changed in that time? How has the situation for writers changed or not changed? Uh, the time that you have been outside China in the US, what has happened to the people uh, working in Shanghai? I think it has changed a lot, has changed a lot. Uh, in the 80s, in the 70s, uh, to be a writer, uh, I think there's a Chinese term, Wen Xue Qing Yan, right? Yes, it's very popular, very positive. Or even if you're not a writer, you just try to be a writer. I mean, so you're, you're, you're good. But nowadays, often the question I got from my relatives and my friends, why are you not doing business, you know? <laughs> And uh, and and uh, you know, in this kind of materialistic outlook, to be a writer is really like you know, 
in a marginal position mm. of the society. And uh, not too long ago, I, I watched TV, you know, a veteran Chinese writer talking about why he's doing business now. And then he openly said, nowadays, to be businessman is fashionable. That's why I want to do that. So what can I say? But maybe I'm still old fashioned. <laughs> I still want to do the same thing, do the same thing. And of course, you know, like nowadays, if you walk into the Shanghai bookstore, I, I believe, you know, we, we must have walked into Xinhua Shudian a lot those years, right? It's, it's uh, quite different. Now in the, in the Shanghai Shucheng, uh, the bookstore, the most popular books are not, you know, serious literature books. More likely, uh, how to make money, mm. how to win the stock market. Actually, I put this thing into one of my inspection novels because he he saw from distance a young girl reading a book, and he's touched. Okay, maybe a Daoshan Dynasty portrait, but when he come close. It's how to do the star market. <laughs> <laughs> so there's there's money in in publishing, but um, not in high end um, literature. Yeah, yeah. I, I brought along actually. I found um, this this magazine. Um, it's called Young Foreign Literature, and it's the magazine. This is from 1988. The issue where Chou Shalong translated two of my short stories. Um, I must have um, qualified for young foreign literature oh. at the time. <laughs> and um, they appear in here. If you compare this magazine, um, there are no ads, for example. Mm -hmm. um, the production values um, are quite that's simple. That, that's the picture, right? The illustration. There are black and white illustrations. Illustration yes. of your short story. There is. Yeah. There's yeah. a wombat. Um, yeah. Um, I think somewhere. Where is it? I just saw that because I remember that. Um, Let me see. You see if you can find it. Yeah, okay, but I what I want it. to do is contrast that with these two um, literary magazines from Shanghai that I got there a year or two ago. Mm -hmm. um, this is called Shanghai Culture, produced by the Shanghai Academy of Social Sciences. Um, a, a very sleek production. Um, this one, Book Town is the publication of Shanghai 99, which is a very innovative um, publisher, book packager. And in here, I mean, there are certainly plenty of ads. Um, there's an article about the New York Review of Books. Um, there are articles about Bing Xing and mm -hmm. um, eminent Chinese writers from an older generation. Um, there are reviews of self-help books. Mm -hmm. um, there's a whole range of stuff, infinite, infinitely more mm -hmm. possibility um, and uh, well, cost uh, of production as well mm -hmm. from what there was in um, 1988. Oh, there's, yes. There's a bear, right? There's a snow bear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> it's actually a wombat. But, uh, uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, but has this not made the situation better for writers, this, um, this greater range of possibility? Um, or is something else happening? Um, I mean, do you want to tell us about how your books um, go when they're published in, in Chinese um, in, in China? Uh, yes, again, you know, the all the change in a very complicated picture. Uh, for one thing, this particular magazine went out of business quite a long time ago. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think those years, these kind of magazines were quite popular. Mm. Sold like, you know, 10,000 copies at least, right? Sometimes much more than that. And uh, this particular magazine was published by Li Jiang, mm -hmm. not like in a large city in Huilin. But those years, you, you, you could find this kind of literature magazine almost everywhere. People were reading them. 
And nowadays, actually, these two magazines, maybe it's not that accurate to call them like elite mm. literature magazine. Yes, on the one hand, uh, you know, it's more and more materialistic, more and more money involved. But maybe because of the change in economy, there were some magazines that still devote themselves to serious literature, like this one mm. and uh, this one to some extent. Mm. But these magazines definitely do not enjoy you know, a large readership as magazines in those years, mm. in those years, mm. yearly among intellectuals. So I don't know how things will you know, really developing out, but things are still changing. Uh, like, 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 I know something about this magazine because it's published by the, by the Shanghai Academy of Social Sciences, in which I worked for quite a few years. A few years ago, this magazine kind of turned itself into a fashion magazine, mm. but it did not really work out because, you know, the editors were not fashion editors. So now they got some money, so they try to come back into serious literature. I really wish they could have succeeded this time. Mm. Shanghai has a very rich literary tradition. Uh, many of the great writers of, of 20th century China have, mm -hmm. have flourished in Shanghai, Lu Xun, Eileen Chang, Zhang Eileen, and, mm -hmm. and many, many others. Um, what about today? Uh, is there still, um, is there currently a rich literary culture? Uh, like you, people sometimes joke about Han Han, right? Mm. They say Han Han is a Shanghai writer, but other people say no, Han Han is not exactly a Shanghai writer. But, uh, I, well, the, you know, some of the writers are still writing, like Wang Yi, Wang Xiaoying, and uh, Chen Chen. They're still writing. Mm. Uh, but I don't know whether they reach the level of Zhang Ailin, as you have just mentioned. And uh, again, it's maybe very complicated. A lot of things, you know, come into the picture. For one thing, the writers have to make money too, right, to be fashionable. And uh, that would be good or bad for literature, that's one thing. And uh, also maybe like my inspection, the right have to survive, you know, in the society too. And, mm. uh, and uh, so it's, it's, it's really complicated, mm. yeah. Uh, it, um, I'm sure it is, is complicated. Um, but I suppose what I'm getting at, and I want to just kind of push this a bit, um, okay. is, well, partly the question of audience. Mm -hmm. um, your, your career, mm -hmm. and whether it's an imbalance of yin and yang that has caused it or whatever, uh -huh. um, has meant that you are speaking to, I don't know about a bigger audience numerically, but certainly a much greater range of people mm -hmm. around the world mm -hmm. in, in our global society than Wang Ai you mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, now, many of you will know her name, a very um, distinguished, very eminent Shanghai writer whose books um, are translated and into English and published. Oh. Um, but her name would be known to far fewer people than yours. Mm -hmm. um, is, it, is it fair to say that a lot of writing from contemporary China does not travel out of China very well. Have you done something very smart um, by writing in a genre, Inspector Chen, detective fiction that is well nigh universal, mm -hmm. but also is a way that people can understand um, a very specific um, local society such as Shanghai? I'm not wanting to put you on the spot. I know this okay, is a little bit okay. embarrassing because. Okay, um, okay. You're here and they're there. Um, but I think it's a, 
we are in a, in a, in a time when things um, are very mobile, even in the literary world. Um, things are translated, they move. You're saying your next book is already out in French. Um, and yet, uh, contemporary Chinese literature um, is not widely known outside China. Uh, you just told me that you went to a translation conference, right? Mm -hmm. About, you know, the problems of translating the contemporary Chinese literature into English. And you certainly helped, like, you know, with Wang's work. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think one of the problems certainly is, has something to do with the, with the translation. But again, it's, it's not translator's fault. At least that's the way I see it. Because uh, I don't know whether I have done something smart, as you have said, because I certainly have done something not that smart, like pushing for the short story, right? It's not a mystery. But I think maybe I have one advantage because in narratology, when people talk about implied readers, so when I write in English, it does not mean I tell myself I'm writing for the English-speaking reader only. But it certainly says something to me because I have to write in a way the English-speaking reader can easily understand and accept. Mm -hmm. And uh, as we have just talked, you know, to understand contemporary China, you have to deal with a lot of things in the past. Now, for a lot of things in China, maybe for the Chinese readers, you don't need any explanation, right? It's take for granted, like, if you're talking about rap cars, people know immediately. Or maybe not for some young readers, like when my book is translated back into Chinese, like Lloyd Carter Dancer. They don't understand what this dance is for, right? But anyway, still, I would say for most Chinese readers, that would not be a problem. But when I'm writing you know, in English, I have to take that into consideration. I cannot do like my dissertation. I can put notes like underneath text. I have to write in a way, maybe indirect way, people will understand what I'm talking about. And also for me, it is becoming more and more important because something about you know Chinese past are not that represented in our literature. So. Even though I'm doing that in English, I think I'm, I'm doing, you know, a meaning. I'm doing a meaningful job in that sense. Mm. So, but like writers like Wang Yi, I'm, I'm not saying that they are not writing in this global age. But because you know they are writing, you know, with the implied reader in mind, so a lot of things it can be difficult, mm. you know. For the for the Western readers to to understand that, and uh, maybe another thing again, it's 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 uh, certainly it's not fair to to say about them, but unwittingly, maybe because nowadays I live part of my time in the states and a part of my time, you know, in China. So maybe it's kind of like double or combined perspective, right? You know, you, I still want to see myself as an insider. Even though my Shanghai friends, the people, will treat me as outside, I don't have objection to that because usually they, it means they will take me to a restaurant. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but at the same time, I cannot help the fact I'm being an outsider to some extent. So the distance gives something to your perspective. So in one sense, 
you know, I'm not like Wang Yi and other Shanghai, right? Because they are living there all the time. They certainly know much more about what's happening. But at the same time, I think I also have my own advantage because this kind of distance, this kind of double perspective. Yeah, yeah well, that, thank you for all that. It's a very, it's a very good answer. Um, and I suspect perhaps even your this outside perspective, this indirect um, route you have taken, writing detective fiction in English, may also allow you to write about some things in, in China that would not be easy to write about if you were in China, in Chinese, writing in a different um, literary uh, style. Um, uh, perhaps a parallel. You, you mentioned somewhere that the Swedish, um, the crime procedural novels, uh -huh, were, uh -huh. were an influence on you, and they're probably the, the best-selling novels of the moment. Uh -huh. uh, Stieg Larsson, uh -huh. the girl with the dragon tattoo, and so on. And I heard someone say that these are incredibly popular in Spain, um, in, in southern Europe, in the Mediterranean countries, because they've always thought of Sweden as a country that is absolutely well ordered totally rational, totally enlightened. And it is the sleaze and the irrationality and the <laughs> darkness of Sweden that is revealed in these novels that uh -huh. they, found, they find absolutely fantastic. Um, so there's a way that crime fiction gives you a space to, um, to change people's perspectives. And uh, I mean, for, for um, many Western people, China is the place that is um, classically inscrutable. Uh -huh, um, uh -huh. mysterious, impossible to understand. But the detective, of course, has to understand things, um, has to do it logically, yeah. has to find a reason, a cause, and explain. Um, and uh, I think to be, to be doing that in the case of contemporary China is very interesting. Yeah, you, you just mentioned these two Swedish authors before the Stig mm. Stag license, yeah. I think. Their name, one is, I always have problem pronouncing their name because you know, this kind of dots above the, you know, the, the letter. Snow Warjow, Mava, something like that. Before okay. Henning Larson, yeah, before yeah, any yeah, of these yeah, people, yeah. yeah, there were others. Yeah. Uh, interesting, I read these two authors were communists. And uh, they set out to write a book Again, not like a detective story, but about the corruption of the capitalist society. But for some reason, I don't know, it turned out into mystery, and then it's become so popular, and they believe it's still doing the <laughs> job for them, and they produce, I think, 10 or 11 yeah. of them. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and just last month, uh, there's an American magazine called Month Review. And I was told it's, it's American communist magazine really left. And uh, they, they published a review of my books and uh, called this inspection a real communist, <laughs> but uh, not a communist official. <laughs> <So> <laughs> So and my editor's really pleased. <laughs> yeah. That's a distinction. <laughs> What's the magazine, Marx Monthly? No, it's no. called a Monthly Review. Monthly Review. Monthly Review, yeah. But for now, uh, please join me in uh, thanking you very much. Thank you. Thank you.